Hi there, thanks for tuning in. Today, we're going to be taking a look at Gravity Co. Let's get started. So, what does Gravity Co. do? Essentially, they make games. They make mobile and PC and sometimes console games. Now, they are more, most well known for their Ragnarok IP, Ragnarok Online, Ragnarok Origin, Ragnarok Begins, etc. So, they have a lot of games in this IP. Essentially, what they do is that they license out the Ragnarok IP to other developers. They make that. Gravity is actually the owner of the IP, and they get money kickbacks from that. So, that's what they do. Right now, they seem to be doing a lot of different MMORPGs, uh, 3D card board games, side-scrollers, but MMORPGs generally of different types, and clearly their most profitable ones are in mobile rather than PC, even though it started on PC. And you can see here their major upcoming launching, so it's a whole lot of Ragnarok, but they do have here and there a few other games being made by other people that they are also the owners of, technically. So, they are a decently sized gaming company. They're based in South Korea, but their largest markets are in Asia in general. So we'll take a look at their profitability. It's clearly been increasing. They've been doing pretty well. And throughout all this time, they were one of the companies, along with some other gaming companies that benefited a lot from everyone being at home in 2020. However, they have seemed to be capitalizing on that past 2020. And that's wonderful. These kinds of games are games that people kind of stay playing, especially on the phone. You may not play it as much as you did when you were locked at home in 2020, but maybe you're commuting and you just play a little bit of whatever Ragnarok game is on your phone. So clearly they have the players captured there. They are keeping players within the IP. So that's good for them, obviously. The revenue still growing in huge amounts and their operating income is also growing as well, which is wonderful to see. So, overall, this paints a pretty good picture. These numbers are in Korean won, just so you know, but my valuation is going to be in US dollars. Now, if you see here, here's the distribution of profits, basically, or of revenue, and you'll see that their main markets are Taiwan and Thailand. Everything else is not even close. Korea, United States gives you a little bit more money as well, but basically, almost all their sales are based in Asia. So that's where they're concentrating, that's where their next launches are going to happen. So that's just important to note. That's where that happens. So any uh, volatility in Asia, anything important happening in Asian currencies as well, will have an effect in their balance sheet, in their revenue and profitability. So that's where you have to sort of follow. Now, they also have a distribution here of revenue. So Here's online games versus mobile games versus other revenue. Most of the revenue comes from microtransactions in mobile games. So 56.4% of the revenue in 2022 came from microtransactions in mobile games. Now, that differs from, for example, 2020, where it was 62.1. So this number is volatile. It went from 62.1, 39.8, 56.4. Still clearly the most revenue that they make, obviously. But they also have some healthy kickback from royalties and license fees. As I was saying, they license the Ragnarok IP, they license some other IPs, and they get fees from that. So that's mainly their business, really. And online games, aka PC and uh, console MMOs, make them some money, especially for microtransactions, but not nearly as much as mobile. Mobile is the big cash cow, as you can see. And overall, lately in these quarters, the revenue, it seems to follow a little bit of a cyclical trend where it kind of goes up and then goes back down and goes up and goes back down. Right now, there's gonna. it seems like they may have a little bit of a difficult year in profitability. They were saying they were going to see a lot of revenue coming in in 2023. That is pretty much because of the second quarter that was just monstrous. However, it'll be important to see if that carries into 2024 or if we're looking at this weakness that was seen in the third quarter of 2023. So... Here's the breakdown as well in the different quarters. So which are the regions that make the most money? Clearly Southeast Asia. And you'll see how this changed big time between 22 and, and early 23. All of a sudden, it went from Taiwan to all of Southeast Asia being what made the most cash for them. This basically can be affected any time by game launches and by uh, purchases of other developers. 
and the revenue breakdown as i was saying mobile is huge for them pc is still pretty big it's actually growing compared to previous quarters but it's not their biggest cash cow right mobile is where the money is to be made and that's just a reality if you're a ragnarok player in pc i'm sorry but their focus is going to be on mobile now i want to make a model here i want to calculate how much uh, gravity is going to be worth in a quantitative way so i'm going to do a discounted cash flow model essentially here i'm grabbing the cash flow from previous years i am just going to say okay the revenue is going to not be turned as efficiently into free cash flow this next year but then from there i'm going to just grow it very very slowly and consistently at about three percent i think that's fair i think that accounts for a lot of volatility especially potentially in asian economies where you may see a slowdown or potentially you never know if there is just some trouble with the Ragnarok IP. I think that's something that I'll discuss about later. But yeah, so I'm going to do a required rate of return of 11%, which is 1% more per year than the overall market. I'm going to do a perpetual growth rate of 3%. And then that divided by the total number of shares out will give me a fair value of $118.51. But then we are generally we subtract for the net debt but they have a net cash position so theoretically we're just adding the cash right we're subtracting a negative number that's just adding so the fair value post debt will actually be 166 dollars and nine cents with the net cash included really so let's compare that to the current price of gravity okay interesting so let's talk a little bit about this first of all they're a small ish company they're a 505 million dollar company in terms of market cap they have a P.E. ratio of less than five right now. That is tiny, tiny, monstrously tiny. And if you see right now, they're a company that has gone through some wild swings. In 2020, you could have snapped this up for maybe 30s. Then it went all the way up to 200. Now, then it went back down to around that 45 level. And then it went all the way back up now to a 52-week high of $82. Right now, it's 72.7. So it's been for quite the roller coaster ride. Clearly, you see long-term volatility here in the short term i don't know if it'll jump all of a sudden to 200 dollars but at least in the long term there are clear sell points clear buy points if it was a 200 dollars, there's no reason to keep gravity around in your portfolio but if it was at 48 it was clearly a buy so it will have those points if in five years it did that i'm sure in five years from now there will be multiple buy and sell points so that's just something to note i also want to talk about the EV to EBITDA gravity compared to other competitors, some of which no longer exist, of course. Activision Blizzard was acquired, for example. Glue Mobile was also acquired. So just knowing that. But generally, their trailing of their forward EV to EBITDA is tiny compared to an industry median and compared to most of their competitors. So they're a very different company. They're also a very tiny company. 505 million versus the billions of dollars that all their competitors, even mobile exclusive developers like Glue Mobile before they were acquired, uh, were way bigger in terms of market cap. So that's important to note. I think small caps in general have that likelier chance of outsized returns. So it's cool to pay attention to gravity in that context. Now, here's the other thing I want to talk about, and I want to put a lot of attention into this. They're owned in by 59.31% of their shares are owned by Gung Ho Online Entertainment. That's a Japanese game games holding company, essentially. And then 40.69% others, including the shareholders. What does this mean? This means Gung Ho calls all the shots, really. The shareholders, there's a shareholder meeting, which is a token, I'm pretty sure. But Gung Ho just owns the company outright, calls all the shots. You don't have a say as a shareholder. There's no activist shareholders. There's nothing like that. Why is this important? Well, notice that they were sitting on a pile of cash here. So the fair value, I said, was higher because they had cash that you added back. Now, that cash has been there for a long, long time. And I mean an absurdly long time. They, their cash position has only grown. Now, two things are important here. One of them is that they do need cash on hand to operate and just create games because they're very expensive and they give you that money later. So you do need cash on hand to sort of like create games and pay developers before those games are even giving you revenue. But the other reason that this is important is because one, culturally, Asian companies don't have a lot of debt and just carry a lot of cash. But two, this is cash that could otherwise be reinvested into the business. It could be given out as a dividend. It could be used to buy back shares to acquire another company, etc. 
and they're not really doing that. And the thing is, like, because Gung Ho owns them, and so they sort of can't make their own decisions as to what to do with the cash, it's more of Gung Ho's call, this is a thing that some investors may really not like. You may not love the fact that they have all this cash that they're sitting on, and they probably won't do that much with it. And if they do, it probably won't be with a whole cash pile, right? So this is just something important to note. And this will talk about my summary. So gravity seems very healthy and well positioned in financial terms. You have overall a growing picture. You have healthy free cash flow in general. It's pretty. It's been pretty good. You have just a growing picture. I think the overall gaming market is growing, especially in Asia. The Ragnarok IP is fine because they keep releasing new games. Maybe the original Ragnarok Online is not as healthy as it used to be, but they just keep releasing these things. People in Asia clearly like it, and to some lesser extent in the Americas. However, I would caution against a valuation that takes the net cash into account. So instead of that $160 level I got, maybe that 118 level is closer. And this is because cash is unlikely to be used in the best interest of shareholders, really, and some of it has to be on hand in order to create games. Thus, ask yourself if you want to own a company that is under no shareholder control, and if that's the case, then you have to be aligned with what the management is doing. You have to like that management is running the company very conservatively, that that cash pile is going to be there and not really be touched, and if you don't mind this, then see also if you're comfortable owning a company with a single important IP that generates great cash flow and see what the risks are in that, right? If you maybe know Ragnarok and as an IP really intimately and maybe you feel like that's going to decline, then maybe that's something that you may not be comfortable with. I think focusing on this risk first is great because it helps you ask yourself these questions. They have a great balance sheet, but here are some possibly structural things that are important for me to take into account. And if you're still comfortable, then then you could invest, okay? So my concluding thought here is that business structure matters a lot. You have to see how the business is structured, who owns it, what their incentives are. And if you're comfortable with that, then you can invest it. This is important too with family with family owned companies. Those are those can be very volatile or very great. It just depends. So the business structure just matters a whole lot. You have to study it, you have to understand how they structure the business to make money and how the owners are looking at that. And if you are comfortable with that structure, then you are poised to have an investment that fits with your goals and with your portfolio. Now, thank you very much for watching. I appreciate you watching all the way till the end. If there's any company you want me to analyze, please feel free to comment down below. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day.